So as I mentioned, this is our second in the series, tree and shrub ID presentations. And this one is uh, emphasizing shrubs. And one of the things we've got to think about is what's the difference between a tree and a shrub? Uh, and there's a definition out there that a tree is typically generally a single stem and normally 12 feet tall or taller as a mature individual. And then shrubs fall into this category. We have multiple stems typically originating near or from the ground line and generally shorter in stature than trees. But there's some crossover with some species in this definition. And so I have got some species in here that in many cases could be considered small trees, but also might look very much like shrubs or large shrubs when you encounter them. So I try not to get too wrapped up in those definitions because we do have a little bit of interchange depending on the individual characteristics of some of these species. So one of the first things I recommend folks do is recognize that any presentation like this cannot be nearly as comprehensive as we need to be to make you really adept at identification. And one of your best tools is to provide a high quality field guide that's going to give you good photos, good descriptions, perhaps even range maps, and also some keys that you can utilize to help you determine what species you're looking at. And I think this is really the Cadillac of the guides for shrubs and woody vines in Indiana. This is by uh, Dr. Harmon Weeks and Sally Weeks. Uh, Harmon Weeks was a professor of wildlife biology at Purdue for many years, one of my professors. Sally Weeks taught dendrology at Purdue for many years. And I would say in many cases, it's really kind of taken on the mantle of Charlie Deem as one of our preeminent botanists in the state. And these are just, this is a fantastic book. I think uh, many of the offices may actually already have this book in place. And so it's a great reference if you've already got it. If you don't have it, it's put out by Purdue University Press, but also available for many of the online booksellers as well. And I will kind of refer to this book and some of our characteristics we're going to use for identification. So there's a couple of ways you can use this and many other field guides. You can identify these things using really two approaches. One is if you're fairly familiar with some of the trees and shrubs you're dealing with, you can simply work through the text based on the branch and leaf characteristics or arrangements. And so plants in these guides are typically separated based on whether they're conifer or broadleaf, whether they're a vine or shrub or tree, evergreen or deciduous, alternate or opposite leaf arrangements, simpler compound leaves, and a variety of other characteristics, including whether they're native or introduced. The other thing you can do is work through a key. And so a key is essentially going to give you choices based on characteristics of the plant and progress you through a series of choices to the point where you can actually identify at least the genus, if not the plant itself by species. And so in using keys, we oftentimes are using what's called a dichotomous key or a couplet key. And so we've got two choices. So it's providing us some kind of biological or characteristic description of this plant. And so in this case, we're looking to see whether the leaves are compound or whether the leaves are simple. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we have a compound leaf. Now, how do I know that's a compound leaf and not multiple leaflets or multiple leaves? Well, what I'm looking for is a bud at the base of where that leaf starts. And so we aren't going to find any buds at the base of those small leaves on the left-hand side, but we would find in many cases a bud and or a difference in texture and color where that leaf attaches to the twig. So that's what makes a compound leaf. It's got something that's got a leaf stem and leaflets. A simple leaf, just as it says, is one leaf blade on a stem attached to the twig. And then the bud would be at the base of that leaf stem. And depending on our characteristic we find for that plant, it's going to take us to another set of choices. And so those numbers refer to the next choice couplet that you would go to. These keys uh, can be very effective at helping you identify plants once you understand some of the plant characteristics that are used as descriptions in these keys. And so here is one of our primary characteristics we use in identification of almost any kind of plant. And that is whether the leaves are arranged opposite each other on the twigs or are alternating on the twigs. And so the left hand side, this is a shrub dogwood stem and most of the dogwoods have opposite leaf arrangements. So you can see the leaves are coming out directly opposite each other on this twig. 
on the other page or other side here on the right hand side of this photo, we have autumn olive. And autumn olive is an invasive introduced species and it has alternate leaf arrangement. Now, if you look, you can see these leaves are alternating back and forth in a zigzag pattern to some extent on those twigs. The other thing we're oftentimes looking at is uh, character of the edge of the leaf or the shape of the leaf in some cases. And in particular, the edges have several different patterns that we can see. We may have, like we have on the left-hand side here, a leaf that has what's called doubly serrated or doubly toothed margins. And this is where we have a large tooth with smaller teeth on top of the large tooth. We find this in particular on elms and some of those related species. On the right-hand side, on the top, we've got serrated or toothed margin. And these teeth can vary a lot in size and texture and in number, but we are going to see that saw edge essentially there on the margin of the leaf. And then some leaves have an entire margin, meaning it is completely smooth and there are no teeth on the edge of that margin. Those are characteristics that can help us and are oftentimes used in many keys. In addition, we can also look at twig characteristics. And so the pith on the very inside of twigs, it may be hollow. This is actually an Asian bush honeysuckle, a good characteristic for identifying it, hollow pith with a, a tan coating on the interior. Many other species have solid pith. Some will have a quirky or spongy pith that may be a different color than the wood in the stem. And so those can all enter into the description for these individual species and may be found in the keys. On the upper right hand photo, we've got an example of where we may have hair or fuzz on the twig or buds. And so this is butternut and butternut oftentimes will have this hairy, almost like an eyebrow above the leaf scars on the twigs. And we may have also prominent lenticels, uh, these little uh, structures here that help with gas exchange in the plant and they can be different colors and different shapes and also small to large depending on the species we're dealing with. On the lower left hand side, some twigs may have banding, striping, or striations on them. And so this is Eastern burning bush or American burning bush, or also called wahoo, one of our native euonymus species. And oftentimes the twigs are this really attractive light green. And on the uh, older growth, it will actually have these four lines running up and down the twigs, almost giving the twigs a square appearance. Really good characteristic for that particular species. Some other species will have a fair amount of corks or quirky wings on the twigs and stems. And this particular example is bur oak. Now we've also got what type of leaf we've got. We've talked about whether it was simple or compound and also whether it was alternate or opposite. And that oftentimes for our hardwoods, our broadleaf trees uh, and shrubs is the starting point for determining what group of species it belongs in. And so I'm going to kind of walk through several of these categories and give you quite a few examples of uh, what some of the species are in these different groups. So hopefully that's going to be helpful for you in terms of thinking about how to collect these and how to use the keys and the characteristics you see in the field to identify some of these species or at least get them into broader groups that are going to help you narrow it down to the right choice. So in the broadleafed alternate simple leaves category, we have the one exception in the dogwood family that's native to Indiana that does not have opposite leaves, and that is alternate leaf or pergoda dogwood. We have the service berries, also called June berries, cherries and plums, hawthorns and crab apples, witch hazel, and then there are several other natives and also invasives. And the, the leaf shown here is one of the hawthorns. So alternate leaf or pagoda dogwood, it's one of those that's kind of in that category between large shrub, small tree. Sometimes it has a single stem, sometimes it's multiple stems coming out of the ground, so it really kind of crosses over that definition boundary. Unlike the flowering dogwood, it has very small clusters of flowers rather than the individual blossoms we see on flowering dogwood. Still has the typical dogwood leaf with those prominent veins that kind of curve along the edge of the leaf margin, entire leaf margins, and really attractive purplish stems. And that's one of the characteristics of dogwoods. Oftentimes they've got these really nice looking smooth and colorful stems across the species groups. 
Serviceberry, also called Juneberry, there's several species we can run into, varying from generally oftentimes single-stemmed in trees to multi-stemmed and more shrub-like, all of them in the Amulanker uh, genus. Uh, really an attractive tree. It's got beautiful white to pinkish white blooms that bloom very early in the spring, one of our earliest natives. This gray bark that's smooth with the striations. Uh, later on produces these uh, little hips or berries that the birds really relish and are actually edible by humans as well. And then good fall color on it also. And it's been suggested as a really good choice to plant in place of the invasive calorie pear because of its great characteristics. So alternate simple leaves. Another one of our natives that really is an attractive and also a fantastic wildlife plant is American plum. This species forms really dense thickets, dark stems with rather flaky bark that's reminiscent of a small black cherry, produces abundant plums in many cases from the blossoms that pop up in the spring quite early. These uh, hedgerows or clusters or agglomerations of all these sprouts that come up from the ground can really produce an enormous bloom pretty early in the spring. But I have never been able to pick a ripe American plum. The wildlife utilize them so quickly that uh, they're almost always gone by the time I'm looking for one that's not too astringent to eat because it's just not ripe enough. Now, this one also has alternate simple leaves. Another really interesting one is witch hazel. Once again, you see alternate simple leaves, really interesting margins on these leaves, relatively large teeth, almost rounded rather than, than a sharp tooth, and a leaf that tends to be relatively broad across the very middle, almost egg-shaped. And one of the most interesting characteristics of witch hazel is it blooms in late October into November. And so these little spidery yellow blossoms will show up in the fall rather than the spring, and then the fruit will start developing the next season. So really a, a unique plant in that category. Smooth gray bark, uh, we oftentimes find this growing near streams or in moist bottoms or valleys. The hawthorns are a really complex group, oftentimes kind of a small tree, but they may also be very shrub-like in their appearance and growth. And some botanists have made the comment that uh, the hawthorns can tend to kind of ruin a nice walk in the woods for botanists because they are so difficult to identify to species. And so I really never tried to separate the species out on hawthorns. I kind of lump them in together in a group. They're very similar in their characteristics and habits on the landscape and the benefits they provide. To be warned, one of the pretty consistent characteristics for most of the hawthorns is bearing large, sharp thorns. And these thorns can be an inch, inch and a half, in some cases almost two inches long, are unbranched, just look like a needle and they certainly are painful when you encounter them, but that also makes them pretty good nesting cover for an escape cover for many birds. And the hips or berries that are produced are a pretty good survival food. They're not highly favored, and so they'll tend to hang on into the winter and be utilized by a variety of birds, particularly some of the songbirds that migrate through. This is kind of a typical leaf pattern, but we've got a lot of variation in that as well. All of them alternate simple leaves, well, it can have a really nice blossom display, but I will say the odor of the blossoms is not what I'd call pleasant. It's kind of an off odor, almost sickeningly sweet. One of our smaller shrubs, it's very shade tolerant. We'll find this in the understory of forest areas, underneath shade, typically on moist, highly productive soils, preferentially, but it'll grow in a variety of locations, is spice bush. And this is well named. It's actually related to uh, sassafras. If you tear the foliage or scrape the stems, you'll typically get this relatively strong lemony odor. And we've noticed that deer really won't browse this much. And so it does have a tendency to build up in forest understories and can also kind of make a problem with itself for that becoming uh, almost too aggressive and preventing regeneration of other species because deer are, are essentially selecting against it, allowing it to grow in population. Alternate simple leaves, they can see an entire leaf margin, these red berries that are produced in the fall that birds will utilize. Interesting little paired flower buds that we can see over the winter and into the spring before they flower, and little yellow flowers. Barberry is one of our invasives, and so there actually is a native barberry, but it's exceedingly rare, only found in just a few uh, kind of northwestern, north central counties, and it is typified by these little paddle-shaped leaves with teeth on the margin. So our native barberry has teeth on the margin of the leaves. The invasive 
Japanese barberry, which you're going to run into much more common, unfortunately, has uh, untoothed leaves that are paddle shaped and kind of originate from these little spurs along the twigs, but they are still alternately arranged in terms of the location of those leaves. And it can produce these abundant crops of these little red berries, even in the shade of the forest and understory, quite shade tolerant. Typically not a real large shrub. I've seen them hip to maybe chest high at most, usually oftentimes knee high or lower is what I run into. But they do have pretty sharp thorns, produce these little bell-shaped flowers, and oftentimes they'll bear some thorns where those leaves originate at those little spur points alternating back and forth on the twigs. If you scrape the twigs on these also, you'll oftentimes see a bright yellow color in the underbark. So one of our invasive species, it's introducing itself from landscape plantings in towns and around houses. Autumn olive, another one of our invasive species, and unfortunately this one has been planted for conservation purposes in the past. Wildlife habitat, probably also some soil erosion control. It's a nitrogen fixer, so it can grow on some really tough sites, but it also can produce an enormous amount of these red berries that the birds will utilize extensively, and that causes a lot of spread. It's an aggressive grower because of that nitrogen fixation capacity and it will tolerate a little bit of shade. It doesn't like shade as much as some of our other invasive shrubs, but it'll still hang around in woodlots, but it's really a big problem in open, semi-open areas that don't get regular burning, mowing, or other maintenance. And it does produce some spur thorns along some of the twigs occasionally too. So alternate leaf arrangement, elongated simple leaves with the very uh, silvery undersides and also silvery speckling on the new twig growth. So if you turn these over, it's almost like looking at silver maple, really light silver undersides to the leaves. The stems themselves tends to be a pretty rangy plant. Older stems are gray. The younger sprouts and suckers are typically a tan brown color. Okay, let's take a look now at our broadleafed alternate compound leaves. So we're still alternating, but now we're looking at a compound leaf. And this includes plants like poison ivy, Virginia creeper, roses, blackberries, and raspberries, devil's walking stick, the sumacs, and several other natives and invasives we'll take a look at. So the one we have pictured here is actually one of our native roses, and I believe I identified this one as pasture rose, although we have several, and their characteristics can be quite similar. One of the characteristics of our native roses, though, is at the very base of that leaf, you'll see those two little wings down there at the very bottom. Those are called stipules. And our native roses, they typically have this just regular shape. On multiflora rose, which we're going to look at in a second, there will be little hairs running along the edge of that stipule. Also, our native roses will typically have larger, more single flowers, and oftentimes they have a nice pinkish to even a reddish uh, color. So those of you that aren't already familiar with poison ivy, good idea to get familiar with it. Compound leaf, three leaflets, alternate leaf arrangement, it can be a climbing vine on trees. It can be a vine or ground cover creeping along the forest floor. It can also even become shrubby. So I've seen this along fence rows and other locations where perhaps what it was climbing on ultimately decayed or disappeared. And it was woody enough that it could kind of stand on its own. So a variety of different forms and habits it can take. The leaves are three in arrangement and typically have relatively scattered large teeth on the margin of some of the leaflets. So that can be a pretty good characteristic. Another good characteristic on the twigs and buds, the buds themselves are elongated at the very tip, the terminal bud, and have almost a suede tan appearance. So it almost looks like a tan suede material that makes up that little bud. And obviously something to be watching out for because of the dermal toxicity issues it, it presents. A devil's walking stick, would typically be categorized as a small tree. However, we find it growing in communities of root sprouts and so it can look really shrubby in terms of its form. And it's a really unusual one in that it has doubly compound leaves. And so on the left hand side here, this whole leaf structure with these many leaflets is one doubly compound leaf. So it has a large central leaf stem, stems along the edge coming out along the edge of that large central leaf stem and then the leaflets are born on those side those secondary leaf stems. So this whole leaf can be three feet long in many cases 
and has a very large central stem that attaches and a great big leaf scar where it attaches to the main stem of the plant. And it's well named and it is extremely thorny on those main stems. So it grows mostly in the southern third of Indiana. And if you're running up and down hills and are grabbing for twigs to, to kind of give you some purchase, this is not one to grab a hold of. Extremely thorny, pretty painful experience, but also a really attractive and unusual plant. It's in the ginseng family. And it has these really neat, large flower clusters that pop up uh, kind of late spring that are really attractive. Okay, next species, an alternate compound, is uh, one that you probably don't run into very often. This is poison sumac. And it's actually more closely related to poison ivy than it is the other sumacs. And you're typically going to be in a wetland type situation. So saturated soils, even some standing water around if you run into poison sumac. I've seen it on a few occasions in some wetland sites or some seepy areas, but it's not going to be found very often if your boots are dry, is really what it amounts to. And the leaves on this look more like an ash leaf to me than they do the typical sumac leaves we see on our upland sumacs like staghorn and smooth and winged. So fewer leaflets typically, larger leaflets in many cases. And the berries when they mature on this plant will be white, just like the berries on poison ivy but it is oftentimes a, a multi or single stem woody plant that can be small tree size. And I will tell you that I don't get poison ivy very easily, but I have been absolutely lit up by poison sumac a few times. So whether it's an issue of exposure or susceptibility, I'm not sure, but it's not my favorite plant by any means. So here's one of our upland sumacs. Once again, alternate compound leaves, long leaves with many leaflets, and then this more typical of our upland species, it has a red fruit at the end of the season. And also good red fall color oftentimes on the leaves at the end of the growing season. Uh, and this is true almost all of the upland sumacs. So we've got uh, staghorn sumac, which is a very hairy plant. Lots of hairs along the new growth and on these berries, as well as smooth sumac, which looks a lot like staghorn, but is not hairy and then wing sumac, which has a little wings between the leaflets on the leaves themselves and a slightly different looking fruit structure than a staghorn or smooth. And these can get to be, tend to be in collies, so they can look very shrubby, but also they tend to be single stemmed. And so once again, they'll kind of cross over that line back and forth between trees and shrubs. And uh, somebody noted in another program we've done where we talked about sumac that the berries of the upland sumacs are actually edible and you can actually make a little lemonade out of them. They've got a really nice citrusy flavor to them. I wouldn't do that with poison sumac. Probably not good results there. Another species with alternate compound leaves that you're probably going to run into occasionally, particularly in the Tipton Till Plain, I think, is prickly ash. And this species is well named. It's got pretty stout thorns, paired thorns, where those compound leaves emerge from the stems. And it's also a root sprouter and will form these colonies and are quite dense and not much fun to go through because it does have very stout twigs and those thorns are quite stout. And in fact, they remind me of the thorns that we find on many black locusts. So that paired stout short thorn uh, where the, uh, the compound leaves emerge from the twigs. So here's a picture of those thorns and oftentimes we have a cluster of flower and also leaf buds uh, during the dormant season, right where that pair of thorns is located. And this is a native, but in many cases, folks are working against this because it does create almost impenetrable thickets with those thorns and its root sprouting abilities. But if it's in a location where you don't have to worry about it, once again, it's a native, it's providing some benefits to insects, cover for birds, so it could be beneficial in some locations. Uh, one of our invasive species, multiflora rose, I mentioned the little stipules at the base of the leaves for our native roses having just a solid little wing. You can see here on multiflora rose that that stipule has little hairs sticking out on the sides. And so that's a really good separating characteristic between our natives and this invasive when you've got the foliage in place. Compound leaves, oftentimes seven to nine, sometimes even more leaflets. Strong hooked thorns are pretty typical on multiflora rose, and it is it can be a climber as well. It can form both hedges, but also climb into trees and get to be quite large. 
clusters of white to pinkish white flowers. Remember, most of our native roses have more singular flowers that are larger and typically pinkish. And then the fruit, small hips, once again, because the flowers are in clusters, these are also held in clusters. These are normally a quarter inch in size or even less. Many of our native roses produce a significantly larger hip in smaller groups. So now we're gonna take a look at broad leaf opposite simple leaves. And so we are now to the opposite leaf arrangement. This includes species in the euonymus group, most of the dogwoods, viburnums, and then several other genera and several invasives, including the honeysuckles. And so I've got pictured here, the vine Japanese honeysuckle. And if you look, you can see those leaves are originating opposite each other on the vines themselves. And this is a woody perennial vine, so it definitely falls into our category for woody shrubs and vines. One of our natives, and this is another one that can be single stemmed in tree form, although almost always quite small, or many sprouts and shrubby, is American burning bush or wahoo. This is not to be confused with the invasive burning bush. This is much more of a small tree form as opposed to a bush. It produces larger leaves, still opposite each other on the twigs. Typically, we don't see much in the way of quirky wings on here, but we will have those white lines that are running up and down on the twig like we see on the lower left-hand photo. In the spring, it has these uh, interesting little purplish four-petaled flowers. And in the fall, it'll produce these really interesting fruit structures with a pink capsule on the outside and then reddish berries on the inside. And this little tree can actually have fantastic fall color. Reds and maroons are not uncommon at all on the leaf surface, but never gets to be very big. It tends to like kind of moist areas or field edges. Fence rows is where we typically find it. Uh, this is one that you may or may not have even run into, partly because of deer. This is becoming rarer on the landscape all the time. It's highly favored by deer. This is a vine, crown cover, trailing or running euonymus. It is a native. Uh, would be a great replacement for winter creeper and periwinkle were it not for the fact that deer just seem to munch it to oblivion in many woodland situations. The nicest patch I ever ran into was just outside of the lodge at Turkey Run State Park and I'm guessing it was just the foot traffic and the amount of people in the area that prevented the deer from chewing it out of existence. Really attractive opposite leaf arrangement, kind of creeps along the ground, it can get to be 18 inches tall or so. It is uh, not evergreen, so it will lose its leaf area in the fall and produces these very typical euonymus berries with a little capsule on the outside and the red berries on the inside. This is our invasive burning bush, wing burning bush. This is the one that's commonly sold at many of the landscape locations, although now finally we've got uh, with the terrestrial plant rule some limitations finally on getting this thing out of trade, not being sold anymore, but it's still pretty common in the landscape. Birds will eat the seed, it's got good shade tolerance, spread it to woodlands, and uh, it just takes off from there. And it can become a huge problem as bad as Asian bush honeysuckle. Uh, you can see that it has these quirky ridges or wings along the stem, much wider and quirkier than what we see on our native euonymus. Smaller leaves that are more uh, elongated, not as wide. And also, this is much more of a, a multi-stem shrub. Uh, so you typically aren't going to find this really in much of a tree form. It's going to be very shrubby, but very competitive in forest environments. You can see this understory here. All that pink and red is uh, winged burning bush or winged euonymus. Another euonymus that's a really significant invasive species is winter creeper. This is a ground cover vine, but it will also readily climb onto the trunks of trees and even get up into the canopy and spread out limbs that will then put flowers on and drop additional seed. Very shade tolerant. It's uh, opposite leaf arrangement, as you can see, relatively simple little leaves, but it's got these interesting white lines for the veins on the leaves that very much contrast with that dark green color. And the leaves have so much wax on them, they almost look plastic. It almost looks like a fake plant in some respects. And that actually can make it very difficult to control for invasive species control. Oftentimes we'll need uh, extra surfactants or penetrants like an oil to get a herbicide to penetrate that waxy coating and be effective in treatment of winter creeper.
This will root where the stems touch the ground so it can form large colonies. And it's been planted in Indiana for 150 years. And so we've got some places in the woods where there's acres covered by this and it can really prevent the growth and regeneration of a lot of our native plants. So opposite simple leaves, real plasticky looking waxy coating and somewhat evergreen. You'll definitely find leaves on through the winter. A really interesting and highly beneficial group for wildlife are the shrub dogwoods. Uh, I've got one example here of red osier dogwood, more of a wetland species, but we find these shrub dogwoods all across the landscape of Indiana from wet to dry. Uh, several different species. This is where having a good guidebook is going to help you a lot in terms of identification characteristics because there are fine differences between the texture of the leaves, the color of the berries, the color of the stems that will help us separate these species. And they typically do have rather attractive colored stems, everything from purples to reddishes to yellows. Normally clusters of small blossoms, the typical dogwood leaf with the veins running along the margin of the leaf and very prominent. And then berries, usually in fairly substantial clusters, and the berry colors can range from this white to purples and almost blacks. And all of them are relatively highly favored by a variety of birds and other wildlife. And these tend to be very shrubby and form multiple stems, really make great wildlife food and cover plants. Another species that you'll run into on uh, steep slopes, moist areas, seep springs, uh, places like this, places that don't get a lot of deer pressure because this is favored by deer, is wild hydrangea. Uh, this also has opposite simple leaves and a bloom structure that looks very much like a Queen Anne's lace flower. Uh, so really attractive plant and it's actually the source plant for a lot of the horticultural hydrangea you can buy at the nurseries. So one of our great additions to the Indiana landscape, really attractive, has a fair amount of shade tolerance and will blossom in shade, but somewhat limited in terms of its population because it is favored by deer in many locations. So opposite simple leaves. And then we have several native viburnums. One of the most common ones is black haw, viburnum prunifolium, and prunifolium meaning cherry-like leaves or plum type leaves is what it's really referring to. And you can see the, the simple leaves opposite arrangement on the twigs, these elongated buds that almost have kind of a purplish color to them, and then very fine tooth margins. Sometimes the margins will almost look entire, but if you look really closely, you'll see really fine teeth on there. Clusters of small white flowers that ultimately produce these clusters of berries that will typically turn very dark purple to almost black, and then are uh, readily consumed by many bird species. And these are very shrubby, but can get to be quite tall. I've seen these 15, sometimes even 20 feet tall in some cases, uh, producing really good cover benefits for wildlife. Another one of our native viburnums that I find on upland sites, particularly in oak hickory woods, is maple leaf viburnum. And it's well named, it's opposite leaf arrangement, and it has a leaf that looks very much like maple. And in fact, maples are also opposite leaved. And so you might look at this and say, well, that's just a little seedling red maple but it bears looking at the stems. So the stems on maple leaf viburnum, they're gonna be not very straight. So they're gonna be very shrubby and crooked. So that'll help you separate from a seedling maple. And then this flower structure, once again, uh, somewhat resembling the flower structure we see on wild hydrangea. And this plant could also have very nice purplish fall color. Another species that's opposite or whorled and simple leaves. And when I say world, I mean it may have more than two leaves at the leaf node. So our opposite leaves, two leaves directly opposite each other, this can have three and sometimes maybe even four leaves at the same location, but they are all still located directly opposite from each other. So more than two in some cases, that's where we get that world designation. This is a really strongly wetland associated plant I find this growing along the margins of the ponds or ephemeral wetlands we find in the interior of some of the woodlots, particularly in northern Indiana. It can tolerate standing water seasonally and produces these really attractive little round blossoms that turn into a round seed head later in the fall and, uh, and into the winter. So a good wetland species, great for pond margins or wetland margins, opposite leaf arrangement, simple leaves. This is a species, uh, coral berry or buckrush, that grows uh, oftentimes in sprout colonies, never gets to be very large. I've seen it about chest high in many cases. Very small, thin twigs, small 
kind of uh, egg shaped opposite leaf arrangement, uh, lots of sprouts in the locations, and then these really uh, diagnostic dark maroon clusters of berries that show up in the late summer and hold on clear into the winter and sometimes even almost to the next season. So I don't think they're highly favored by wildlife, but probably serve as a wildlife survival food, but are very attractive. Oftentimes I find this in relatively dry or well-drained locations that have a fair amount of sunlight exposure. This could be confused in some cases with a, a small Asian honeysuckle, uh, Asian bush honeysuckle, but this does not have uh, hollow pith. So if you cut into this, this is going to have solid pith. Typically everything about this is much smaller than the bush honeysuckles. And that's what we got next is uh, the Asian bush honeysuckles. There are several species and some hybrids and that is kind of demonstrated in this picture on the lower right. This is my property when I was just getting started with invasive species control. And I had what I believe was both Amur and Tartarian honeysuckle. Tartarian on the left, the Amur on the right. Slightly different textures and colors. The Tartarian tends to have a little hairier leaves, make it a little bit different in flower color, yellows, whites, and in some cases even some pinks. But the uh, fruit is typically uh, orangish red to red, leaves directly opposite each other. The twigs are pretty uniformly kind of this gray color, much lighter color than many of our native species. And once again, if you cut into that twig, what you're going to find is a hollow pith on the inside, usually with this tan coating. So that's a good characteristic to separate it from most of our natives, which typically have solid pith. Very shade tolerant, can grow just about anywhere. All right, our last category, broadleaf opposite compound leaves. This is a little more limited group. So we've got bladdernut, elderberry, and trumpet creeper. So bladdernut is a uh, colony forming from root sprouts, a small tree to large shrub. I normally see it more as a shrub size, very seldom gets, uh, it's really tall, but it does form pretty dense colonies, particularly in moist soil areas, and it's quite tolerant of shade. So it'll be an understory plant oftentimes found in kind of moist coves or long stream corridors. Three leaflets, opposite leaf arrangement, very greenish twigs, but the older twigs will have these white lenticels. They're very prominent up and down on the twigs. So that's a good identification characteristic. And perhaps the best identification characteristic is the fruiting structure. It's this lobed bladder that contains seeds on the inside and they're in dangling clusters and in the spring, the flowers that produce these are little dangling yellow bells, essentially. So once you see those, you know immediately, hey, this is bladder nut. And we'll oftentimes find it fruiting prolifically, particularly on the outside edge of the woods where it's getting a little bit more sunshine. So opposite compound leaves, three leaflets. Looks a little bit like poison ivy, but the tooth margins are very tiny as opposed to the large teeth on the margin of poison ivy. And remember, poison ivy is alternate. A really attractive native plant, once again, fairly shade tolerant, but it gets its best blooms in full sun, is American elderberry. And these blooms can be a foot across in some cases, uh, really attractive, producing large clusters of small dark berries that the birds will utilize to a great extent. Opposite leaf arrangement, compound leaves, the leaves look a little bit like an ash leaf. So a pinnately compound with several leaflets on the edge and a terminal leaflet. The stems themselves tend to be rather uh, herbaceous and pithy. They will be perennial, and so it'll grow back from that same stem the next year with new leaves and flowers, but they're easily broken and have kind of a large spongy pith on the inside. So it's uh, not heavily, strongly woody, but it is still a woody plant. Kind of arching canes, and they can get to be fairly tall. I've seen them 12, 15 feet tall in some cases on really high quality bottomland sites. But this is a really showy plant that could have a lot of uses, particularly in bottomland areas, shady areas, or where you really want to provide some great visual effect and also wildlife food benefits. Opposite compound leaves. And finally, trumpet creeper. This is a vine, actually can be quite aggressive. It is native, but many people consider it a weed because it will overrun almost anything and everything. It can be problematic in tree plantings and cover up trees. So, I guess buyer beware. It has certainly its benefits. Uh, hummingbirds really enjoy these orange tubular flowers. Opposite compound leaves, once it again, the leaves are, look very much like ash leaves, that pinnate compound arrangement. 
but a uh, quick growing and relatively aggressive vine. All right, and finally, I mentioned how important it is to have some good references for doing identification. Native trees of the Midwest and shrubs and woody vines of Indiana and the Midwest, two excellent sources available from Purdue University Press and also online sellers. For trees in Indiana, I also like the 101 Trees of Indiana by Marion Jackson, Indiana University Press, but available from many, both online sellers and also bookstores. And then let me mention our resources on Purdue Forestry and Natural Resources Extension website. Uh, that website I posted on our chat as well. I've done a series of tree ID videos that you can access there. We also have some other information on tree ID, including some publications on particular trees or groups of trees that I think will be very helpful for you. So you can check those out. I've also got a webinar on there for identification of invasive uh, woody plants. So you may find that useful as well. And associated with that is a webinar on control and management of invasive woody plants. So you're welcome to access any of that information. And then finally, I would appreciate if you can to uh, take time, take our survey, give us some feedback on this. this. This helps us a lot in terms of planning programs in the future. It helps us justify the energy to do these programs and folks give a feedback on how this is useful to them. So I'm gonna try to post also the link in the chat section again, so you've got access to that. If you've got a, a QR code reader, you can take advantage of that right now. So I'll leave that up for a second. If you wanna get that out and try to scan and go there, you're welcome to. If not, I'll try to put that link in the chat. And I'm going to stop sharing here in just a second and we'll tackle any questions we may have.